Hello, my name is Dr. Dervila McCann. I'm a cardiologist and Chief of Population Health at Central Maine Medical Center in Lewiston, Maine. When I began practicing cardiology here in New England several years ago, I began seeing patients with heart attacks at a very young age, and I learned that many of my patients had a condition called familial hypercholesterolemia, or FH for short. Familial hypercholesterolemia is one of the most common inherited genetic forms of heart disease and leads to extremely high cholesterol levels. This in turn leads to heart attacks and strokes at a very early age. Although familial hypercholesterolemia is found in every ethnic group and in every country around the world, certain groups have this disorder at a higher frequency than others. One such group is the Franco-Americans, particularly in the New England area, who are descendants of the original founders of Quebec. This founder effect has led to a genetic increase in this disorder. To understand why Franco-Americans in particular have this disorder at a higher rate than other groups, you need to learn the story that weaves together geography, history, and genetics. A few years ago, sitting down with Dr. Weiss, he looked at my chart and he said, all of my other patients with your history are dead. I knew that I probably had a problem when I was younger because my, my dad told me that I had a problem with it, but I completely ignored it. Felt like it's not gonna take me down, you know what I mean? So I was, uh, you know, I didn't take any meds. I didn't really go to the doctors too much until my mid-30s also, I was 34. Um, I actually, uh, I had a heart attack, pretty good size one. Well, we really got serious about getting the family tested when Carl had his heart attack. So I have been on medication since I was 10 years old. And in the morning it was drink a glass of orange juice with this really gross powder in it and choke it down. And you know, at 10 years old you're like, what is cholesterol? You, you don't know any of the human anatomy and you know nothing about that. So you're just drinking this orange juice every morning. Um, I got really, you know, weak. My arms got numb, just like I said, and getting white in the face and sweated a lot. And my wife said, you gotta go to the hospital. You know, we're gonna bring you down there. I was like, oh. When I was 10, my cholesterol was about 350. Um, and now it's between 160 and 180 most of the time. When my mom decided to go vegan, she went in January and I was in college, so she had about a five month period where she was testing it and she had really great results. So then that summer when I came home from college, I said, I'm gonna eat every single thing that you eat. And I was a very, very strict vegan. I didn't eat any meat, no cheese, no dairy, nothing and my cholesterol was really, really good. It was almost 150. A day or two went by and, you know, my doctor came in and said, you know, you might have to have bypass surgery. Bypass surgery. I wasn't sure what it was at the time. After my brother had his episode, which he didn't mention, it was a quintuple bypass surgery, so he needed five, five bypasses. Uh, that was an eye-opener for me to spend some time with him the day after his surgery. So then I hooked back up with the doctor and got back on my meds and just ate the regular standard American diet. I never smoked, so I had that on my side. It took me about eight months to get past that uh, process of, of having a, you know, open heart surgery. Um, you know, I, I, was, I was afraid, I was, you know, I didn't know what was going on. I, I looked into a lot of things. I, I pretty much became a vegetarian. I, I was very scared of everything that I ate, everything, everything that was around me. If anybody was smoking near me, I didn't want them around me because I was paranoid about everything because I thought maybe it was going to happen again to me. Um, cause I, you know, three small children at the time too, so, uh, you know, but I felt weak, you know, the, the, the food that I was eating wasn't, I, I lost a lot of weight. I was down to like 135, and I just wasn't gaining my weight back. I wasn't feeling energetic, and so then I, about eight months after that, um, you know, I stopped doing. I stopped doing that. I started eating, you know, fish and you know meat and, 
and stuff in your protein. And I still continue to this day try and eat as healthy as I can. You know, try and stay away from the, the canned foods and stuff like that. Eat, eat as many fruits and vegetables <coughs> as I can, but I do still eat like, um, you know, fish and meat and steak and hamburger. The great rivers of New England. Many have names given to them by the native people who lived along their banks and tributaries. The Kennebec, the Androscoggin, the Merrimack, the Connecticut. These great arteries have served as a source of food and water, transportation and power, shaping the history of the people of the region. Water power from these rivers was the natural resource that centered the textile manufacturing of the U.S. Industrial Revolution in New England. Throughout the 1800s, mills sprang to life from Maine to Connecticut and the need for skilled laborers grew. Many workers for the factories and mills of New England came from America's northern neighbor, Canada. In particular, the French Canadians, who were descendants of the original founders of Quebec, were drawn to the work in the textile mills of the northeastern states, where they were offered high wages and predictable employment. In the 1850s, a wave of immigration to America began, eventually leading to more than 200,000 French Canadians leaving Canada. River travel, made way to a railroad system from Quebec through New England. Several enterprising businessmen raised money to build a short addition to the railroad system, enabling the immigrants to end their journey close to the mills, like this one in Lewiston, Maine, where a small rail depot sits just next to the large Bates textile mill. This was one of the very first stops on the way south from Quebec and thousands disembarked here, staying in this region of central Maine for the remainder of their lives. A particularly strong Franco-American presence was established in the New England region and persists to this day. Often, one family member, such as a father, would begin work and then send for his family, who were also able to work at the mills. Child labor was considered a necessity particularly in the weaving of cotton, where any break in the thread would shut down the weaving machine. The broken threads had to be hand-tied in order for the work to start again, and the smaller hands of women and children were better suited to this task. Sharing a common language, faith, and history, the Franco-Americans often lived in close-knit communities called Little Canadas, near the factories that employed them. I was coming down the one-way street on Oxford Street and I saw the lady was sitting on the stoop and it reminded me because I have relatives that lived on Lincoln Street so we played in Little Canada when I was little and uh, so when I was coming down the street uh, she recognized me and I saw her get up and I said she turned around and she went hey Louise and I thought it was so funny it brought so many memories because that's how they used to communicate Louise lives on the third floor and they used to, I remember, they used to talk to each other from window to window over the street. You know, I thought, tu es sick? J'ai besoin, je t'ai pas faire une tarte, you know, and, you know, so they brought the sugar over and stuff. And so it was really interesting, uh, you know. The work was difficult in conditions that we now recognize as unhealthy and unsafe. Though the work was hard, family and social support was strong and large families were common their health considered a blessing. Music and dance were woven through the leisure times of the Franco-Americans. There is a French saying, lose your language, lose your soul. And though the language lived on in the large Franco-American communities, speaking French came with a price. Well, of course, we went to French school only, which was St. Peter's and St. Paul's school and so on. We only started learning in school uh, English around the third grade. Only one class. My, I have a brother who's on, I had a brother, he's passed away now, uh, who's only 15 months younger than I. And in high school, uh, the French kids had to stick together because you weren't allowed into the clubs. And, uh... In the 1950s, the Ku Klux Klan had a large membership in New England. 
Their activities targeted Franco-Americans who had held on to the culture that made them distinct from the English-speaking Americans. Despite hard work and prejudice, French-speaking descendants of the original founders of Quebec continued to work and live in the industrial centers and handed down their unique culture, Catholic religion, and language to their children. In 1900, the average life expectancy in the U.S. was only 46 years for men and 48 for women. Over the next 100 years, due in large part to public health improvements and an understanding of the cause of infections, life expectancy became much longer. We were five children. Six, we lost our first, mom lost the first daughter. I'd have an older sister. Often, uh, they used to call them blue babies. She was, seemed to be fine. Uh, she was born at home and uh, with my grandmother taking care of the, the birth and um, everything was fine. And then the second day something happened and, and she turned blue and they lost her. During that period, it became more evident that culture was not the only thing handed down to the new generations. As the general population lived longer, it became obvious that Franco-Americans had a high rate of heart attacks, often at an early age. It was not until the late 1900s, however, that the reason for this was revealed. It was found in a gene that caused high cholesterol levels. Many Franco-Americans have this form of genetic heart disease called familial hypercholesterolemia, or FH for short. Familial hypercholesterolemia is one of the most common life-threatening inherited medical conditions. Individuals with familial hypercholesterolemia have a 20 times greater rate of heart attacks than ordinary people. Unfortunately, this disorder has been diagnosed in only 10% of the individuals who have familial hypercholesterolemia but the disease is extremely treatable. Please have your cholesterol checked. If you have a diagnosis of familial hypercholesterolemia, all of your first degree relatives should also be screened. There are many sources of excellent information about this disorder through the American Heart Association and through the Familial Hypercholesterolemia Foundation. Thank you very much for your attention.